Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for this week uh, are for Sunday, March 23rd, 2023, which is the fourth Sunday in Lent uh, for year A. Our first reading is 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. The psalm is 23. Uh, our second reading is Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, verses 8 through 14, and our gospel this week is John chapter 9, verses 1 through 41. So all of these texts are a bit familiar to us uh, as we continue our Lenten journey this week. Yeah, so why don't we start with John? That's always a good place to start, I think. And I'm hearing you say that, Carol. Yeah, and this passage, I say this every year. But uh, particularly as it comes around this year, we were talking before we got started this morning that these texts are, the last time we saw these texts was three years ago. And the way in which we heard these texts in the context of, of this pandemic that we had no idea what was happening and what was going on and 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 I think a lot of preachers out there probably barely remember even preaching on this text because they were busy trying to figure out, OK, how do I how do I do Zoom and how do I record things? And all of a sudden learning all these new skills. And so I when I think about that and look at this passage, the the commentary covers the covers the 9, 1 through 41, uh, just fine, gives some good good details and good background for the passage. But I, I, I know I sound like a broken record, but you really do have to keep on reading when you, in, when you think about this passage for preaching uh, in terms of what does, what does healing really mean for the blind man and uh, the man born blind. And because what ends up happening, of course, is that Jesus does not stop talking at verse 41 at chapter nine. He keeps talking and that the, those new metaphors or news and new images about Jesus as the shepherd and the door are really meant for the blind man to hear the promises that are now for him as one of Jesus' sheep that Jesus finds a blind man after he's been cast out in 934, just like he found his disciples in chapter one, just like he found the, the woman at the well in chapter four. Uh, now he finds this man who has been uh, cast out yet again. <laughs> he's lived his whole life cast out and now he's cast out again. And then Jesus in finding him fulfills the promise of 1016, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them in also. And so the way in which maybe people have experienced their own sense of not being able to see or not being able to see clearly or having trouble seeing who Jesus is and where Jesus is and how Jesus is active and present in their lives. And, uh, and the way in which uh, the words of chapter 10 offer these these promises of protection and provision and and pasture and abundant life and and relationship and belonging all of which the blind man has who knows when he ever had it if he ever had it and i wonder if maybe those are some of the words that people might need to hear this year of feeling left out or cast out or uh kind of in a in a place of 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 um uh, of not being able to see what what what's in front of them or what they need to see, and then uh, Jesus' promises of of the good shepherd and being the gate might might be words of promise and hope this year. It's important because the the story is told in chapter nine. I mean, it's interesting. There's drama. Obviously, for the man, his life is changed in terms of his sight being restored or. or being able to see for the first time, but the, the sense of connection, his interaction with Jesus is kind of lackluster. in, in, in my point of view, there's, there's a lot of confusion. He's not even fully sure who he is when they finally get to talk face to face at the end. 
and can see each other, you know, uh, who is the son of man <laughs> so that I might believe in him. Uh, you know, Jesus says, you've seen him. And he says, I believe. And if that's the end of the story, it sounds like the story is mostly kind of cognitive. I mean, yes, he has this physical change, but for a lot of, at least a lot of Americans in the 21st century, belief is this cognitive thing and it requires some kind of justification or explanation. We don't get a sense in nine alone, chapter nine alone, the idea of a relationship or the idea of, of belonging. I think you need those, that language from chapter 10. Otherwise it just sounds like a, a weird, not weird, it sounds like a kind of a basic analogy of moving from spiritual blindness or, or a kind yeah. of a kind of agnosticism to then belief in that kind of enlightenment way of thinking. I don't think that's what the story is. Mm -hmm. um, obviously the, the being cast out of the synagogue and the uh, perhaps being disowned by his family, it's not quite clear what's going on there. Mm -hmm. This person gets set adrift from community and from household and from belonging in the course of chapter nine. And the cure for that isn't just belief, but it's this right. idea of being brought into a fold. So. I think I'm just repeating what you said, uh, but warning that chapter nine alone is is not as exciting as chapter nine plus chapter 10. <laughs> yeah. Or how do you nuance that? How do you gloss that idea of what does belief mean for this man at this point in time? Is this trust? I mean, what is this belonging? Is this relationship? How are we going to talk about that? Yeah, and as I said, what, you know, what does healing mean? I mean, healing is, mm. uh, is not, not, not only this this moment of being cured from uh, from his blindness, but it's a uh, it's a healing into wholeness uh, that is being offered uh, for him, and and that that you can't get without chapter ten, and so uh, and so I think that again I, I'm just repeating myself, but the way in which uh, the way in which the preacher is really attentive to uh, the promises of, of chapter 10 for the blind man and for all people who are brought into the fold. And so, as you said, Matt, that believing is, and, and we know this in our conversations from John, that believing is not a cognitive category. It is a, it is a synonym for relationship with Jesus and the fullness of that relationship, which is, which is what Jesus promises in chapter t um, 10, verse 10. Joy, you were you gonna say something? Yeah, I appreciate. Uh, I appreciate um, one of the ways that I heard it is Caroline. You kind of talked about this in a communal sense, uh, and 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 Matt, you kind of talked about this from the individual, uh, from looking at this 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 individual who was born blind and is now restored to community, and in both of those, there's this reality that that what this is all about is being restored to relationship with God and one another. I mean, that's, you know, you, you go all the way back to the fall. I, I, I love the fact that you guys just gave me permission to use the whole canon because you use more of John. So you, you teased me and, and I'm, I'm taking the bait. But the, if we talk about the fall, we have this broken relationship with God, broken relationship with one another. And the promise of God is restoration of that. And Jesus demonstrates that. And it's particularly demonstrated in, in this particular encounter. As, as we've been watching, uh, these people are found by or find Jesus and, and their lives are, are completely turned right side up if, if we are paying attention to um, the disruption that is actually created. I paid attention to um, some different, um, I, I focused in some different areas as I was reading it this year. And I was just struck, uh, first of all, with what could be a play on words that uh, Jesus saw a man who had been born blind. So the contrast of Jesus' ability to see someone who has no sight. And if you just play with that, we can do all of the kinds of things that you were talking about in terms of how our own education system, how our own um, way of being uh, formed in terms of what the word belief means can 
cause us, they, they become a, a, a set of shades that we put put on that cause us not to be able to see uh, all that is truly happening here. Um, but the other thing that I paid attention to was the fact that Jesus saw this person uh, and the people around him saw the scandal. They sought to see a sin. And in the midst of brokenness, in the midst of despair, in the midst of blindness, in the midst of need, in the midst of, of, uh, of loss, Jesus sees the person who is a child of God and restores their identity to be fully a glimpse of what it means to be an icon of the creator. And that means full sight. That means re restored to community. That means belonging. And in that, the simple words that are, I believe, I agree with you, don't capture the fullness of what it is that he is believing in. And he's believing the promise of God, even though he doesn't fully know it. Who is this son of God? Who is this son? I, I, I want to know more. Because what I've experienced causes me to want to lean into the fullness of this promise that you're talking about. I hope that the sermons can be preached in a way that causes folks to say, I was blind and now I see and I want to see more. Let me lean into this. I think maybe just a couple other things and then we should go on. <laughs> but um, yeah, I really appreciate that. And and the, the seeing part is important that Jesus sees him before the man sees Jesus. And it also connects to the fact that actually the blind man, uh, the blind man follows Jesus' voice uh, before he sees him, yes. which, you know, he hears the good shepherd and, uh, and, and the and follows the voice of the good shepherd and uh, and which really goes back to John two and the the wedding at Cana where Jesus' mother says do whatever he tells you and abundance follows and that's exactly what the blind man does and uh, and becomes a sheep of Jesus' own fold and in that believing it's recognition of. Uh, and, and, and then he worships him. It is a recognition of this is God at work. Uh, if, and that's what we get at the end of the chapter. If this man were not from God, uh, he could do nothing. Uh, but he is from God and he can do anything. And so uh, that's one thing. The other thing that, that what you mentioned, Joy, is uh, is this connection to Genesis. And I would even make a connection also to the the use of the mud and the and the saliva because uh, this is really that that this is really John uh, the Nicodemus story uh, unless you are born anew born from above born again and this is his born again anew from above moment uh, and so this is this is if you want to if you want to take that back to the preacher wants to take it back to that moment with the Nicodemus, what does that mean? That's, that's what this means. This is, this is being born from above again, anew and a, becoming a child of God, John 1, 12 and 13. This is how it look, this is what it looks like. This is how it gets embodied. So it's not, a, it's not theoretical and it's not assent to uh, you know, a, a cognitive ascent. It's it's entering into relationship, and that's what being born, that's what being born again means. And John's whole writing is this: starting with in the beginning. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I I really appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, I could go on and on and on about this story. I happened to write a dissertation about it. Uh, and <clears throat> however, I would not recommend going to Amazon like we did a couple weeks ago and a book like that book before. <laughs> I would not, although it's dropped in price significantly. I think it used to be $69 and now it's like $7.14 hard copy. Time to get it. Time to there get it. There you go. It. Price to move. Yeah. Woo -hoo. Yep. Anyway. Yeah. Or Samuel. You want to go to Samuel? Yeah. And, you know, I I might 
need to own that my recognition of the scandal and the the looking for what was wrong may have been um, after having read um, this, you know, how long are you going to grieve over Saul? And just the whole idea of what this kingship has meant for Israel when they chose to use the, the, the shepherd language, not to listen to the voice of God, but to be like everyone else, to be like the other nations and have, have a king. And when that king was exactly what, um, what um, they were warned by the prophet that, that he would be, um, they didn't want to let it go. It, 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 that, in that op opening line, how long will you grieve over Saul, who God has rejected from bringing king over Israel? And and I, I, I just read everything right now in the midst of the political chaos that we're living in. And um, I really don't want our listeners to uh, try and decide which side I'm taking um, to say who's most chaotic. I think our governments... Are, are chaotic right now. And I think scripture causes us to say, who are we paying attention to? Are we wanting our man to stand even in their flaws? Or are we willing to go into a different way, which would be the way of God? I, I've kind of been thinking about these Old Testament texts as Lent not so much in the political realm, but more in the congregational. Um, Favorites for me, yes, please. And, and this lens, uh, of course, a text like this lends itself in a, in a variety of, of directions. Um, if you do want to go into the political realm, it's kind of funny that, you know, the text in some ways also contradicts itself, right? That it's not, the Lord doesn't look on the outside appearance, the Lord looks at the heart. And then David shows up and they're like, well, he was, he had, he had nice eyes and was kind of handsome. Right. Like the text can't, the text can't like resist being like, just so you know, he was also a looker. Um, <laughs> but I think I've been saying a lot of these Old Testament readings this Lent lend themselves well to reflection on congregational history and congregational values. And so this week could be talking about leadership, uh, who is valued in leadership, how transitions historically in a congregation have been handled, where you've been surprised by that. A lot of churches I know uh, have a hard time thinking about who, what are the qualities that you want in lay leaders? Obviously you need somebody, most of us who went to seminary uh, could use somebody who knows how to balance the books and, and use a spreadsheet, but, uh, but also like, what are the kinds of gifts that commends a person for leadership in a, in a spiritual community and how might that confound other conventional values. And so an interesting way to, uh, to bring that up and to talk about what is, what does shepherding look like? Uh, there are some of our listeners who, uh, do indeed ministry, uh, conduct ministry among real shepherds. Uh, I don't, I've always lived surrounded by, by asphalt. And so, you know, what is that look like are there other complementary metaphors that we might also use to talk about this because if you're going to talk about the the values that surround leadership in a congregation you're also going to be talking about congregational mission right and what what does a, a congregation understand its purpose to be and to do and in a time where a lot of our metaphors are formed by capitalism and growth and expansion it might be useful to find some other metaphors that talk about, you know, what we're, what we're called together to, to embody in a neighborhood in the world. Yeah. And I, I think uh, not, and in, in addition to leadership uh, and how we imagine that is, I think it's really important for a preacher to consider that on a regular basis of what kind of leader they are and what values they have and what, uh, theological tenets are are manifested in their leadership. At the same time, this this passage also points to what it is. What is it about Jesus that uh, that compelled people to follow him? And uh, and particularly at this point in Lent might be a good question too. In that we get. Well, which is you know not in the in the lectionary, but that's why I also bring in chapter ten as a connection to this, where Jesus 
describes himself as the good shepherd and that uh, that that uh, the sheep follow his voice and what voice are we following and what is it about what is it about Jesus uh, description of himself but also what he does particularly with the man born blind or what is it that a, a leader in God's eyes does that uh, that manifests God's uh, God's own characteristics of caring for um, caring for God's people? And so, you know, I, I I was struck by the line: "There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep." You know, and and so the way in which uh, the blind man is kept, and the way in which. Uh, David will or will not keep God's sheep, um, and so and and how is it that we, uh, how is it that we think of ourselves as, you know, whom who what voices do we follow? Uh, what what uh, yeah what 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 voices do we follow when there's a cacophony of other uh, other voices that we could that we could listen to and go in that direction. And, and yet the blind man followed the voice of, of someone he had never even seen and, um, and then ends up being a sheep of his fold. So that may be another, in addition to what you both have already said uh, with the, with the Samuel passage. Thank you so much, Caroline, for bringing us back to uh, the good shepherd uh, to, to focus on Jesus and if I may, it makes uh, 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 one possible use of the psalm. Yeah. And, and, mm -hmm. and that for me becomes uh, having experienced this healing, having been restored to community, having um, sight in so many ways, um, it just seems like this psalm could roll off this man who was born blind's uh, yep. mouth with yeah. it's like you 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 preach this this um this passage the, the gospel john mm -hmm. you um you talk about his encounter with jesus and the healing and rather than you know the kind of back and forth questions um that can be antagonistic which sounds more like our culture you say if this guy had ever heard this psalm, this this top forty hit from uh, the uh, the King's playlist, I'd I always refer to the psalms as certainly that tune was rolling through his mouth. Now the Lord yeah. is my shepherd; I shall not want. Yeah, I I th I appreciate that joy. That's exactly what I was thinking too. That that how is it that the psalm comes in and in in this sermon and says now um perhaps the first for the very first time or or in a who who knows when that the blind man the man born blind could actually say the lord is my shepherd and and to what extent has never been able to say that and now and now is able to say that because uh, because he has listened to the voice of the shepherd, and one one thing that I wanted to bring in too ten nineteen through twenty one is never in the lectionary. Mm -hmm. uh, we have ten one through ten. We'll get that uh, Easter four. 10, 11 to 18, we'll get that Easter four year B. <laughs> and then 10, 22 to 30, we'll get that Easter four year C because that's Good Shepherd Sunday, but we never get 19 through 21. Mm -hmm. And that might be in um, verses that you would want to bring in uh, as the preacher uh, because the question is uh, so important in, chap in verse 20, why listen to him? Yeah. Why listen to him? Well, in that in that listening i uh, comes the the then becoming his disciple which they say are you one of his disciples and 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 i uh, and it also then means that the blind man can say i uh, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life uh, because i listened and uh, because i heard the voice of the shepherd so yeah i think putting putting this on the lips of the man born blind and uh, and also recognizing that we're able to say that too because we know who our shepherd is. Yeah. Uh, very much experiential of the psalm and not not just explication of the psalm. Yeah. And and the um, 
you prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. I want to read that as a passive account of what has happened, not a I'm ready to go and take on those people that disagree with me. It's, mm-hmm. it's just a recognition that the, the, bl- the man born blind did not go out and say, oh, this dude is really making the authorities angry. Let me find them. It, it, it's a passive. This is what happened. Now that he's a follower of Jesus, now that he is someone who can bear testimony to the good that Jesus is doing, he, these, he has made himself an enemy of these authorities. And yet God has prepared a banquet for him, has prepared a blessing for him, has prepared all that he needs for him right in their presence. It's, it's, it's a, it's a anointing that is what has happened, not something he, you know, oh, I'm ready to take on the world. Mm-hmm. And, and maybe, maybe when we read these passages, we don't want to read them as a, um, grab up all of your, you know, everything you've got and go and storm. Um, but instead, it's just live in a way that God has got your daily bread. And and then pay attention to just what that does to those around you. So the Ephesians text, I'm going to get in on, on the game and, and use this as a launching pad Jack, back to John 9 as well, which you two have done with the other uh, other two texts. Uh, Ephesians 5 on its own is, is tough to get into. It, it might illustrate some aspects of, of John 9, this notion of once you were darkness, but now in the Lord, you are light, live as children of light. I think it's important. Well, two things. One is uh, light and dark imagery is is being interrogated now in a lot of settings, and some of that's for really good reason. Some of that also, I think, points out a need to understand ways in which these ancient texts are viewing things. And so uh, this might be old news to some of our viewers and listeners, but uh, in the ancient world, they understood the eye as, as emitting light, that there was a light that came out from one's body. Well, we understand now the eye is what you know receives light, and that's how you, that's how you see so this idea of, of the man born blind and Jesus saying in John 9, I am the light of the world. And he says there, there there's a sense in which Jesus is putting a light inside of him um, as opposed to like fixing an aperture you know, in his eye, but actually imbuing him with light that then now allows him uh, to, to see through his eyes. And that's also an interesting way of thinking about that. That it's, it's, yes, it's a, we understand this as a healing, but it's also a change in this man's uh, constitution in some way, shape or form, right? Or what his eye is able to do. Uh, and the fact that Jesus describes himself here in John as the light of the world is significant. And there's a way in which Jesus is putting something of himself or something of his power within this man's own self now that that's part of his belonging in this connection. Um, so I don't know if, if, if I would refer to Ephesians five, you know, briefly as a way of talking about what does it mean to be filled with light? Mm-hmm. Um, and how does that affect your understanding of who you are? If that light is, um, Jesus himself, is this, is this illuminating power in the world? So that's mm-hmm. your, that's your yeah. brief first century physiology <laughs> from Matt Skinner well- today. No, I, I, I appreciate that so much because it also then takes us back, of course, to the prologue of John. And (laughs) you've gone full circle. Yeah. I, you know, that's, that's me when it comes to John, but, but it's really important here when we, for two reasons, one, uh, as we come to the end of the book of signs and John, so we're, we're coming up, this is the this is the second to last sign. The next sign is the uh, the raising of Lazarus, and and but also in Lent that the incarnation is coming to an end, mm-hmm. and uh, and in the crucifixion, and so that it, it takes us back then to John one five. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. Which for some John scholars is the first claim of the incarnation before the Word became flesh. Mm-hmm. And so this this uh, this connection to the 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 light 
the light shining in the darkness is a reiteration or a claim, a testimony of what incarnation is, I think goes back to what you were saying, Matt, in that, uh, that in Jesus incarnation, the fullness of our incarnation is also honored and, and, uh, and realized and, and, in and gets embodied. And so there's uh, that in our bodies and in our witness is, uh, is witnessing to at the same time uh, being the light of the world as well, uh, being uh, the light shining in the darkness and that light shining in the darkness uh, is the, you know, the light shines as a present tense. So how does that present tense happen when the incarnation of Jesus is no longer here? Well, it happens through us and how, how much more so than is that promise and that testimony of the, of the goodness and wholeness of the incarnation than on the lips of the man born blind who says, Lord, I believe and worshiped him.